began to speak in regard to those particular significant moments that I better get home and prepare another sermon. Because if you've seen the marquee, I was to speak tonight on the birth of Christ. And it looked like that's where he was heading. But as he proceeded and made the application that he did, it wandered a little bit further away from the specific emphasis I was going to give. So I'll go ahead and cover what I had in mind. If you have your Bibles, you might want to turn to Matthew, the first chapter, verses 18 through 25. Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his mother Mary had been betrothed or engaged to Joseph, before they were come together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But when he thought, on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, you son of David, fear not to take unto you Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For it is he that shall save his people from their sins. Now all this is come to pass that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which is being interpreted, God with us. And Joseph arose from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took unto him his wife and knew her not till she had brought forth a son and he called his name Jesus. We'll come back to that passage in just a moment. It is a common tradition when a baby is born to spread the news, send out cards, giving some information in regard to the newborn child. It is interesting to note the bailout or information sheet that God sent out when his son was born. Just that information is faith building. Before we note some five facts concerning the information sheet that God gave, it might be good for us to give a little attention to what God's information sheet did not supply. That's been put together by some thoughtful poet when he wrote these words as we travel through life from day to day we hear a lot of things the Bible doesn't say they tell us it happened on a cold December morn but the Bible doesn't say when the child was born the wise men came from the east to make a call but the Bible doesn't say there were three after all it's true they brought gifts and raced to see the sign, but the Bible doesn't say they rode camels that night. It's a well-known fact that the angels did sing, but the Bible doesn't say that the angels had wings. The angels worshipped him, and the shepherds did the same, but the Bible doesn't say that reindeer came. 
The Bible doesn't say when they made the Egypt flight that Mary rode a donkey and Joseph held a light. It's fine to give gifts and to visit and to play, but don't think of Christmas as a Bible holiday. Truly, there have been many different facets put together in the traditions that are related to the birth of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And many of those traditions are not in the Bible. However, for a few moments, let's look at some facts that were on the information sheet and be impressed with the faith building benefits that God made available centered around the birth of Christ. These facts will center around number one, the person, number two, the places, and number three, a problem. The amazing thing is that this information sheet came out about six to seven hundred years before the baby was born by prophecy. And that's why God's information sheet is faith building. The first part of God's information sheet relates to the person. Sometime during the early part of Mary's pregnancy, there was an event taking place on the part of Joseph as to how he would relate to this news he had now that Mary was expecting. Of course, she couldn't have kept that a secret after about three months anyhow. But at that time, according to Matthew 1, verse 20, an angel of the Lord told Joseph that Mary was expecting that she would bear a son and that they should call his name Jesus, which means Savior, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Verse 21. Now what we really are wanting to pick up right now is found then in Matthew 1, verses 22 and 23. Matthew states, Now all this took place, that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. That quotation is found in Isaiah 7 and verse 14. It was given by Isaiah about 760 B.C. Now think about it. What a phenomenal birth announcement. The birth that we're talking about occurred 2,000 years ago and some 700 years before that, the information we received was given, or some 2,700 years ago. First, note that it was affirmed that this baby would be a boy. Now, you realize that it's only been in this generation or maybe the previous generation that doctors or skilled personnel would be able with a sonogram to tell us 
in an early pattern whether it would be a boy or a girl. And even a doctor couldn't tell you whether it would be a boy or a girl until sometimes after conception. But here's Isaiah giving us the information that a virgin shall be with child. And Mary was a virgin. And that what was conceived in her was of the Holy Spirit. And it was. And that it would be a son or a boy. And it was. And it even gives us something in regard to the name. One name at least would be Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. And then along right in what we were covering a moment ago in the reading, information, you shall call his name Jesus. For it is he that will save his people from their sins. All that information. I don't think he's here tonight, but we have a doctor among us, Dr. Carpenter, who's skilled in these areas, who probably could operate a sonogram machine and would be able to supply some of this information. And I'd like, if he were here, to have Dr. Carpenter come up here and tell me about a birth of a baby 700 years from now and identify whether it would be a boy or a girl and even give the baby's name 700 years from now. Now, you know if he were here, he would either be embarrassed or think I was crazy by saying that, but we are dealing with something here of pinpointed accuracy. 760 years before the birth occurred. Let me ask you, does anyone here then doubt that Isaiah was indeed a prophet of God? And if you don't believe that, please tell me how he did it. Dr. Carpenter couldn't do it. You can't do it. And I can't do it, but Isaiah did it. However, keep in mind that if we admit that Isaiah was a prophet, that he spoke the truth, then you and I are confronted with the fact that that babe was called Emmanuel which being interpreted means God with us. God was in that baby. Do you really believe that? And if you really do, then wouldn't it call on us to listen to what he might say with some rapt attention? more carefully than we would listen to casual conversation. Wouldn't we want to be interested to know what he said? After all, his other name was Jesus, who would save his people from their sins. That makes it important for us to think about that birth maybe not just now but day after day throughout a year for so much stands or falls on how you and I actually accept the prophetic utterances concerning the birth of Jesus Christ secondly consider the prophetic utterances in regard to the places Three places are actually related to the birth of this baby or in his early life. And all three were accurately reported six 
to 700 years before the baby was born. In Matthew 2, 1 through 6, we are introduced to the wise men. Marty mentioned this some, that some this morning. Who had come looking for the one born king of the Jews. Now that got the attention at least of King Herod because he very quickly deduced that that either meant here is a rival, he was going to die, or he would be dismissed from his throne. And none of that appealed to him at all. Therefore he asked the chief priest and the scribes if they could tell where, and it's interesting to me that he mentioned the Christ. He was conscious of the idea of Christ or Messiah was to be born. And in the fifth verse of Matthew, the second chapter, they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And then they quoted to him the prophet Micah in the fifth chapter in verse 2, where Micah pinpointed the birthplace to be Bethlehem. Now under this day, doctors sometimes miss the day of a birth or where it may occur. Now they plan usually for the day or days when they're thinking it will soon be by their expertise and skills and likely would have one come to the hospital or to a birthing place. But every year you hear about a baby that was born at home, in a car, in an ambulance, and maybe on the way to the hospital. Micah, 735 years before the birth, declared it was going to be in Bethlehem and hit it right on the nose. Now, if you do a little careful research and checking, you will find that Mary and Joseph both lived some 80 to 90 miles north of Bethlehem. But Micah said that it wasn't going to be born where they lived, that this babe would be born in Bethlehem of Judea. And it was in Bethlehem that this child was born. If Dr. Carpenter were here, I might ask him again, uh, with your skills, with your expertise in regard to examinations and whatever you do to detect the arrival of a child, would you be able to tell me 735 years from now where a child was going to be born? Now you know that I'm just playing a game in that regard and that he would not be able to supply the information. But think about it now. Does any of us doubt that Micah had to be a prophet from God. And if we do accept the fact Micah was a prophet come from God, then we're also confronted with the fact that Micah prophesied that this baby would be a ruler or a governor. And hence... If you and I are real honest, we'll have to accept the fact that he ought to be a governor and a guide for each one of us. And have you been and are you at this time really listening to hear what this one might give to you as a place or a guide for you to do this or to do that? Or how much do you talk in a prayer life as you have it that would relate to getting information 
on where you need to be and what you need to do from our governor, our ruler, our guide. Let's build on it again one other time in Matthew, the second chapter, verses 12 through 15. Another place is involved as Joseph was called upon to take Jesus and Mary and go down into Egypt, staying there until King Herod died. Now, now why do that? Verse 15 answers that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Out of Egypt did I call my son. That quote about Jesus coming out of Egypt was uttered by the prophet Hosea. In Hosea, the 11th chapter, and verse 1, Hosea stated that about 730 or 725 B.C. Now, if Dr. Carpenter was here, we'd ask him again. Since you give postnatal and then after birth directions for taking care of a baby, Dr. Carpenter, would you be able to tell us where this baby ought to be a few weeks and months after the birth and know that that's where that baby really needed to be? Hosea did that with amazing accuracy. And do we have any doubt then that Hosea had to be a prophet of God. And the thought to pick up in this, if God foresaw a danger as it related to this baby, wouldn't there be some good reason for you and me on the basis of the prophet of God and God's watch and care over that baby for us to give ourselves day by day into God's care. Harold, you sang the song just a moment ago. C.D. Martin wrote the song. Be not dismayed, whate'er be tired. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care of you. Is there anyone here tonight a little bit edgy? Concerned about how things are going? Feel like your feet might almost be in quicksand? Do you suppose it would be good for us to build our faith of trust in God? that he will take care of you. Now you may be more willing to do that when we note event number four in this same chapter. In Matthew, the second chapter, verses 16 through 18, after Mary and Jesus and Joseph took the flight down into Egypt, Herod the king tried his very best to make it certain that Jesus would not be a king anywhere. And that's the part that Marty's lesson overlaps a little bit with what we're covering. We're just emphasizing the faith side of it, the trust in God side of it, the fact that prophets gave it centuries before it ever happened as a proof that they were men of God. Of course, you know that it was to assure that his theory and plan would be carried out, that he had all the male children from two years of age and younger to be killed. Matthew 2, 17 and 18, then declared that the weeping and the mourning heard throughout that region was fulfilling the prophecy 
that Jeremiah had given about 610 B.C. as recorded in Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, and verse 15. I don't think any of us can really comprehend the impact of what occurred in that region at that time, even though we've had something mighty close to us in this nation just occur. I might cover it this way. You know that if a little baby has been found thrown in a dumpster and is dead, that that makes headline news. Now you compound that by what has bombarded our nation from coast to coast over what happened in Connecticut. We can't comprehend what it really is doing to varied lives in the way of ripped open hearts, tears flowing, we have seen on television a number break down trying to talk about it. There's an indication that the president himself found it sobering enough that it was difficult to speak. But you and I really, we can't feel the spontaneous, heart-wrenching nature of a government decree to kill all the male children two years and under, or from that time when the wise men appeared on the scene announcing that they were looking for a baby that was to be the king of the Jews. But all of this, if you're here tonight, I think especially as a mother, and you have a little one. Think of what it would mean if a government decree came out that all children of a certain age would be killed, weeping and all. Now here's the thing I think we need to pick up from this. Did you know that Jesus Christ would have been in that number? that was killed had not God intervened. Now from our trust point, our faith point, pick up this statement. Every one of us would die without hope if God does not intervene. That's in your life, my life, the life of every one of us. And that being true, doesn't that make it fairly imperative that you and I commit ourselves into God's care and build our faith in a solid way that he will take care. Jeremiah said it's 610 years before that tragedy in that region of Bethlehem occurred. So does any of us doubt that he was a prophet of God? And if he was, doesn't the scene and the suffering and the sorrow and the sadness all make it important for us then to commit ourselves into God's care. Jeremiah was recognizing the fact and Matthew was recognizing the fact that God does care for each one of us and he watches and can even in the future know the day you or I will have a need. One other, and we'll close the lesson. In Matthew 2, still the same chapter, 19 through 23, Joseph was asked then to leave Egypt 
after King Herod did die and take Jesus as it turned out to Nazareth. Verse 23 adds this statement, that what was spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled, and then it tells what that was. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, at this point, we're not able to look to a specific prophet that made that statement. In fact, if you'll notice in Matthew's accounts, he makes it plural, what the prophet said. He shall be called a Nazarene. It seems from the Hebrew construction of the statement in Isaiah 11 and verse 1 in regard to the seed of Jesse and also in regard to a branch or a limb of a lineage being involved, there are some expressions in the Hebrew that would tie in with the phrasing of this idea of being of Nazareth. There likely was not even a city of Nazareth at the time the Old Covenant was giving some of this information. But we do know that he was taken to Nazareth, and it says that was because of what prophets had said, and if any of us, number one, believe that Matthew is an inspired book of God, then we have no doubt but what some prophets somewhere said that statement, and we do know that Jesus then was referred to as Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, think about what we've done for just a few moments this evening. Simple lesson in many respects, so significant in others. But we have noted one person and three places, Bethlehem, Egypt, and Nazareth. And then one problem, the slaughter of little ones, and all of this given with pinpoint accuracy six to seven hundred years before it happened. That ought to help us believe in God and our need for his watch and care. It ought to help us believe that the Bible and these prophets were of God and that Jesus Christ was indeed the Son of God. Or Emmanuel, God with us. Or as given then in Matthew, call his name Jesus. For it is he that will save his people from their sins. So as we come to the close of the lesson, each one of us would do well to ask ourselves, is he my Savior? You could add to this thought of his being a ruler or a governor what was said after another phenomenal event, his resurrection from the dead, Top that one with any cemetery around the earth. And that's when he said, All authority has been given unto me, both in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all the nations, making disciples of them, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he added, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. He gave commands. He claimed authority. And Acts 4 verse 12 just adds, in none other is there salvation. For neither is there any other name under heaven given among men wherein we must be saved. Or, as John would write later, that he was bearing witness 
that God has sent forth his son to be the savior of the world. And that savior said, no one can come to the father except by me. John 14, verse 6. So really, how are you and Christ getting along together at this time? He sits at the right hand of God. And we have tonight noted prophecy after prophecy, six to seven hundred years that deal with one little area of his life about his birth. And every single one amazingly accurate. Faith leads to obedience. Obedience leads to forgiveness. Forgiveness relates to removing fear. And removing fear relates to preparation for the judgment day. Hence, where are you and do you need to be his disciple and be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, rising to walk in newness of life from that baptistry, Romans 6, 3, and 4. Or, if you are here, and most of you I know, are already in Christ, are you as such in a close relationship with God to watch over you this night and this week or whatever time you have left. If you're not, don't you think it would just be an imperative that you get right tonight? And we sing to encourage anyone here who has fears or doubts or a too little faith to bolster it up to the response pattern of coming to him, not just down the aisle, but to him, for he is our Savior. Will you come as you stand in that?